and I just want to begin by um, first of all welcoming both of you and then I'd like to tell everybody a little bit about you. So Pamela Katz is a screenwriter. She's most known for her work with the legendary director Margareta von Trotta, including Hannah Arendt, which was one of the New York Times critic A.O. Scott's top 10 films for that year. Also Rosenstrasse, of course, The Other Woman, and Forget About Nick. And uh, her other films include Remembrance, starring David Rashi, and an original comedy, Home Sweet Home. She is currently writing Kessner's Ark, and that tells the controversial story of Rezo Kestner, the Hungarian Zionist who agreed to trade 10,000 trucks for the lives of 1 million Jews. His so-called deal with the devil is furiously debated until today. As an author, Pamela has published essays and articles as well as the book, The Partnership, Brecht, Weil, and Three Women on the Brink, um, published by Doubleday and Nan A. Talese. Pamela is an adjunct professor of screenwriting at the NYU Tisch School of the Arts graduate program as well. And perhaps most importantly to me, I have the great honor of being Pamela's sister. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Florian Ballhaus. He was born in Germany, began his career in America at the age of 16. He started out working as a second camera assistant for his father, the renowned cinematographer Michael Ballhaus. And he worked his way up in the industry to second unit cinematographer with directors like Martin Scorsese, James L. Brooks, and Mike Nichols. He began his own career as a cinematographer in 1997, shooting his first American feature films with directors such as Alan Rudolph, Secret Lives of Dentists, and Adam Brooks, Definitely Maybe. He enjoys close collaborations with Adam Brooks, um, excuse me, director David Frankel, five films, including The Devil Wears Prada, Robert Schwenke, seven films, including Flight Plan and The Captain, and the critically acclaimed The Captain won Floriana Cinematography Award at the San Sebastian Film Festival, as well as the 2018 German Camera Award. So just to get this out of the way, Pam and Florian are sitting together and they're maskless, but it's okay <laughs> because they're married. Um, so. I'd like to begin our conversation and I'd like to start with you, Pam, just to, if you would provide a little background as to why we ended up choosing this time period to have the festival and show these two films. Okay, first I wanna say the honor goes both ways. <laughs> We're both thrilled to be part of the Kingsborough Performing Arts Series. It's an honor for us. So thank you so much for bringing our films to this wonderful audience. Um, we're showing these films today in particular um, because 78 years ago, almost to the day at the end of February, um, the Nazis launched what was going to be the worst and most brutal roundup of the Jews uh, to date. The film Rosenstrasse and the events that you see where the women are protesting take place in 1943 at the end of February. Um, Goebbels promised Hitler and these are his words, a Jew-free Berlin by his birthday in April. And that began with what you see in the film or what happens as the film begins. It was called the Grosse Fabrik Action. And that means the big factory action. And the, one of the reasons it was called that is because they picked up most of the men, most of them, not all were men, um, at their places of work. And one reason they did that is because suddenly the very few rules left that had protected Jews up until this point um, were suddenly gone. So you were no longer protected by mixed marriages. But the rule of law was very literal in Nazi Germany. And they knew that they wouldn't necessarily get away with it because it was still the law that you were protected by a mixed marriage. So they caused all this chaos and confusion by picking people up at work so that when the men didn't come home, again, mostly men, the women, as you see, had to run around finding out what happened. And in that time, they felt they could get the deportations going. So it was very deliberate chaos and it was a very deliberate flouting of their own laws. Um, and one thing I found very interesting when I first started to work on the film and something I think the film portrays very well is, as you say, Anna, what's lesser known. 
if you don't know much about how the Third Reich functioned, you think from the moment Hitler took over, Jews were deported to concentration camps immediately. That's not true. Um, it took 10 years for him to be able of slowly eroding the, the situation for Jewish people. So first you couldn't own a business, then you could no longer have your profession. Then as you hear in the film, they take your apartment away. Then they say you can't own pets. Um, a film I'm working on now it, um, has a scene in it in which uh, blind Jews were not allowed to have their guide dogs. So it was very incremental. And that's crucial to understanding how Hitler and the Nazis got away with wholesale murder. It was precisely because it was incrementally done over 10 years. Um, and this, what you see in the film, what we pictured happening on day one, happened 10 years later. And the women standing on that street had lost everything except their husbands. And that I think is the context for the film in terms of how it's, it's different from other films about this period. Right, well, that's fascinating. Wow, thank you. Um, I, I just wanna dial back to the very beginning of your project um, and, and maybe if you could talk a little bit well, let me first say the director, uh, Margareta von Trotta, for those of you who aren't deeply familiar with her, I did want to talk about her just briefly. Um, Margareta von Trotta is widely referred to as a leading force in modern German cinema and the world's leading feminist filmmaker. And many of you might know some of her films, Marianne and Julianne, Sheer Madness, Rosa Luxemburg, and of course, Hannah Arendt, for which you, Pam, were the screenwriter. Um, but this, Rosenstrasse, was the beginning of a very long and successful collaboration that you've had and are still having with Margareta. And I'm wondering if you can talk about how that came to be, how you two came together, you in New York, her in Germany. Okay, um, well, so first of all, I of course had heard of Margareta. Um, she's actually just coincidentally one of the reasons I wanted to make movies in the first place. Um, Mariana Julian, she was the first uh, one of the first women to win in Venice for that film in the early 80s. So it's almost 20 years, oh my God, 40. almost 40 years ago. <laughs> Sorry. Hello. <laughs> um, that I saw that film, I was just out of college and I thought like that's the kind of films I would like to make. Um, and later on in my, in my work with Margarita also worked with that same actress, Barbara Sukova, who then played Hannah Arendt. Um, so when she called me, I almost, fell over. In fact, I thought it was a friend playing a trick on me, you know, on the phone. Um, but she came to me because she had this project for about eight years. An original script only showed the times in the past. It was only the 1943 period. And she was told at that time, unlike now in a way, it was very difficult to make films about the Nazi era then. People were quote unquote tired of it. And one of the suggestions that was made to her was to bring in a modern day element and to bring in a particularly American Jewish point of view on this story, to bring in a modern audience, to bring in a more international audience. And she, we had a mutual friend and, you know, she was a little concerned. She's used to writing her own scripts. And I, I think I was presented as somebody she would get along with as well as she would get along with anybody in this situation. So when she called me, I was thrilled. But at that time, she had this idea that the modern day Jewish element would be Orthodox Jews. And that this idea of somebody marrying outside the fold causing this crisis was caused because they were, I mean, more or less what we would know as Hasidic Jews. And I panicked for two reasons. The first being, I know nothing about that. Um, and I very much wanted to work with her. And the second being that it's quite often true in German films that if you're Jewish, you're Hasidic. And they're not these sort of gradations. And I, I felt like that even if I could research that world and know about it, I wasn't sure it was the right way to go, but I very much wanted to work with Margarita. Um, and I was afraid of also coming up short even as a secular Jew because I didn't know much about the traditions. And she was coming to me partly as a Jewish expert, which was sort of funny to me. Um, so I went in and I said, look, in Berlin in the 20s, it, the most or many Jews were secular. Many Jews didn't even know they were Jewish until the Nazis started taking them away. And I said, wouldn't it be a better parallel if we actually talked about a more assimilated Jewish American family 
looking back on this time. And isn't it more interesting that after the death of her husband, she, she goes back to her past and it awakens this past trauma. And that's more interesting if you've raised your family in an entirely secular way. So they're completely shocked at your reaction. And that I thought was also a stronger push for Hannah to go to Berlin to find out what's going on because she has never seen her mother like this before. So in a way, my fears and my biography started to meld into what actually took place in the film. Which is so interesting because I was curious about that in terms of, as you were writing it and particularly the character of Hannah, if you felt that you identified with her, her having a Holocaust survivor for a parent, uh, being about to be married to a non-Jewish man, and if that influenced the way that you wrote it and, and the way that you worked on the script with Margareta from that point forward. In two senses, very much so, yes. And I, and I always, I mean, I was definitely in the category in some ways of Ruth and in some ways of Hannah of being very disconnected to this very powerful, if you would use the word legacy that you and I both have, that our father, and, and Anna and I disagree on how much our father talked about his past. I felt he very much didn't share it with us. So I really related to that in Ruth that she never spoke about it. Um, and, and I also hadn't dug into that world myself. I think I grew up being encouraged to be interested in other things. Like so many Jewish people of our generation, we were encouraged to look forward and not back. And so, yeah, so there was a sort of awakening that was taking place as I was working on the script. And Margareta was very interested by that awakening because she was interested in how much I pushed it away. And on the flip side, she would often say, "My, I have these Jewish friends and they live in Riverdale and they told me that this is how Jews have Shiva. And I said, there are as many Shivas as there are Jews. So I was pushing for this more individualistic way of looking at Jewish people. And she was afraid as a German of getting it wrong. So as I've told Anna this story, she called me up one day and said, what do the stools look like? I said, stools, what stools? And she said, the stools for Shiva. I said, I I don't know. I've never seen any. She said, I heard all shivas have stools. So it was very, so she started to educate me in one way and I was educating her back in another way. But I've always said, and, and since that time, I've written so many films about that period of time. And I, and I credit Margareta, who had to grapple with her German history, which she did very much as a political 68er. She had to look back on what her country did. And she really pushed me to look back on my past and my history and understand it better. I mean, she didn't feel you could be a whole person without understanding your past. Um, right, which, which I think did, you, you mentioned that we have different memories about what we heard growing up and I feel that I heard about it all the time and you feel that you never heard about it. But, <laughs> but the interesting thing was that then working on this film and others, I guess, it really led you to dig deeper into our father's past and find things out and eventually wrote a piece about his experience leaving Germany. And I realized then that while I thought he talked about it all the time, he never talked about himself, which also really resonated for me with Rosenstrasse that uh, they really don't know their mother. They don't know a lot of things about their mother. And, and the whole idea of secrecy in the film and, and, and lies, you know, uh, from Hannah not telling Lena why she's coming to interview her and uh, Lena's brother telling her not to tell Fabian what she did to try to save her. And uh, Lena, not, I guess it was Lena did not tell Hannah uh, Ruth about her mother. So there are all these different ways in which there are lies and secrecies. And I, I found that really interesting. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the decisions that you had to make there in terms of the impact of being the child of a survivor. Yes, and, and being the child of somebody who you realize is, I think I didn't realize it as a child. I think you realize when you get older, the things you didn't know and, and now can't ask. I mean, I found, as you know, all these documents, so certain things came to light, but not the things you might have asked, you know, had we been older when our father died, we would, there's so much we might have asked now. Also, I know much more from all this work I've done, I would be able to say, but what about and, and what about? But with regard to Hannah, you had asked me, they said, like, why not just come and say, I'm Ruth's daughter, hello, da-da-da. And 
my feeling about that was she's just found out that, as you say, she doesn't know her mother. She doesn't know what happened to her. Her mother refused to tell her. This is her one chance. She's going to go to Berlin. She finds her. And by the way, the way in which she finds her seems very movie-ish. It's actually quite realistic. The Jewish community has tremendous records of, of people and, and registered where they lived and so on. So the way in which she finds her is actually quite plausible. But how is she going to approach her? She doesn't know how they split. What happens if there's still anger there? What happens if there's um, an old woman whose memory is, you know, gone? What, what, what happens essentially if she slams the door in her face? Then the door closes on this time and she may never get it out of her mother. So my first thought was she's going to go there as this historian um, because she feels that gives her the best chance of finding out, so to speak, the truth. And I think another thing that the film teaches you is that truth is so, so relative in this case. So she wants her to bring it up on her own because she feels then she'll get the truth. And one thing that was true in other versions is not quite true now. Hannah is a historian. She and her fiance and her father were all interested in Latin America. That was sort of also my projection of being a person who looked the other way, didn't study Germany, but went to study other cultures. I had studied anthropology. I studied West Africa in college. So I made it Latin America for Hannah. So she is a historian. So she is as a character invested in objective reality of a sort. And I believe that part of her journey, and you see how she can't control her emotions as the interview with Lena builds up. She also has to learn that just, you can't quite find out the truth. You can find out the emotional truth. But Lena has her memories. Perhaps when the movie ends, Ruth will now share some of her memories. We don't know. We hope. Um, but this idea of coming in as a historian is something she both was as, did as strategy, but also because she thought that was the best way to get the truth. But in the end, the emotional scene at the end, when they really come together, that comes about by emotional honesty and not by getting the facts out of her. Right, right. Well, that's great, thank you. Um, I wanna just fast forward to the end of the movie, which I had a moment about. Um, obviously I saw it when it first came out and I was really curious to see how I would respond to it during the times that we're in now, seeing it again. And I found the ending, the wedding scene, more uh, provocative, more um, complicated, I guess than I did the first time around. I think the first time around, I felt the this, this sense of resolution between the mother and the daughter and the sense of we're in New York and whatever happened then is so, so far away. And now when I watched it, I thought, it doesn't feel so far away anymore with current events here and in Germany. And I wondered if you felt that way watching it again, that like, would you have written it exactly the same and how everything comes to resolve? But, a larger sense of peace and the peace between mother and daughter. Did you see it differently because of what's going on now? It's, it's hard to say because, because, I mean, it comes down to this very contentious Jewish issue of to assimilate or not to assimilate, to intermarry or not to intermarry. And on and both those subjects, my opinion hasn't changed in the least given you know, given what's going on in the world, I still think it's absolutely fine to intermarry and it's absolutely fine to assimilate into a culture. Um, I think what what maybe feels haunting is is the anti the rise of anti-Semitism and the rise of right wing extremism all over the world. So the events in France, the, the rise of the neo Nazis in America, and or horrifyingly in Germany. So I think you see it differently in the sense that when I wrote that, when I would hear people say things like it could happen again, it, the Holocaust, I honestly still don't believe that, but I nevertheless, it's a little bit, the idea of it is a little bit closer. There's a few too many swastikas around the, the world. Um, there's still too many forms of prejudice against all kinds of people, not just Jewish people, but also Muslim people. I mean, the whole world is practically on fire right now with violent prejudice. Um, so I think we all feel a little bit more frightened. I don't feel more frightened as a Jew. I feel more frightened for the world, but I don't see 
so to speak, not intermarrying or not assimilating. I don't feel like I should go make Aliyah in Israel to protect myself, you know? But I, there are very many people who very legitimately feel safer in Israel. I would not. So my opinion of the ending doesn't change them. I don't know if it's a message. I think Margaret is a director who always valiantly fights against messages. Um, I think it was important for Hannah's mother to accept her her fiance again, because you want to show, for me, what you want to show is, as you said, is reconciliation. I mean, you want, you have to know the truth. And I think that what it was saying is that if you've been lied to, and silence is also kind of a lie. If you've been lied to, when you find out the truth, you are more at peace. So if the film has any message, I think it's just that silence creates awful problems. And if you can go on a journey like Hannah did, you will be a more whole person. Are there other ways to show someone <clears throat> being whole than a wedding? Certainly. Um, but in that case, that was the story we had in, in that moment. So yeah, no, I don't- Thank you. No, yes, that's a lovely answer. And I, yeah, I wasn't so much focused on the wedding itself is more just the larger uh, image and feeling that was going on. And that's a beautiful answer and, and I, I appreciate it. Um, I do want to take some moments with Florian and then after that, we'll be opening it up for other people to ask questions as well. But thank you, Pam, that was really fascinating. Um, so Florian, you're yeah. in a more mysterious part of the industry, at least to someone like me and those of us who aren't insiders. And I'm curious because I feel like you've made so many films with such vastly different looks. And I guess for an example, I would say you made The Devil Wears Prada with Meryl Streep, but you also made Flight Plan with Jodie Foster. And those two films that just have widely, distinctly different looks and, and approaches um, in terms of your work. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about your process as a cinematographer. I think of you as the person that tells the story visually it, that's in the room for the film. And I'm wondering, how do you go about that? And you know, what's your process? Where does it begin and where does it go? Well, my process begins where Pam's end, you know, <laughs> it, it really starts with the script and it starts with, you know, with reading the script. And, um, and there's a very different approach to whether you have worked with a director before, you, you kind of go into the process with, in a certain kind of way, you, you have a history together, you have an approach together. And, or if you if it's a new director and somebody you you have to sort of interview for for a script so you you know you try to initially just get an understanding and of it visually try to come up with a with a pitch with an idea of, of how you could see that movie and and what you think could work and how it works within within the genre of what it is and and what interests you and what you think um, the visual sort of cornerstones of it should be and and really I think. A lot of that process is has to happen with the director. It really, it's about I think focusing the director to visualize his movie, his his vision for the project and the story he wants to tell. And I think it's a lot of my job is is in a way is to just kind of confront the director with these realities and say, well, how do you want to see it? Whose eyes do you want to see it through? What do you want to visually tell? We know with the words on the on the page, but how do you want to translate that? And what feeling do you want to evoke? And um, um, so that's it, that's really the, the the biggest process is kind of finding, and a lot of that has to do you know finding a point of view and finding a, a vision for it and finding projects that might be similar in in look and projects that are very different. Sort of you know just finding your way. And I, I always try to I always say let the movie find its own look. I, I, I unless you're doing a real genre piece, it's like a film noir or something. I feel like you need to have a light touch and let that evolves sort of in your, as you're preparing the movie, which usually takes, you know, anywhere from six to 12 weeks to you, you sit and you talk and you find locations together and you, and you, you're after something, but you want it, you want to let that shape itself to a certain extent in the process, in the creative process, rather than going and saying, it has to be this, everything has to look exactly like that. Interesting. That leads me into another question I was curious about. Um, when you were looking at the book Thief, and you have the narrator who's deaf, do you, how do you decide whether to do the whole film from the point of view of death or when to veer away from that? I mean, how did, how did that look in the room when you were trying to figure that out? 
Yeah, I mean, there was that the book thief was a very interesting case for that for that dilemma because it really, I think, what worked in the book really wouldn't have worked in a movie. I think you need to, I think, in cinema much more so than in literature, you need to have a very relatable character that kind of takes you through the process, and you need to be able to, um, especially for you know, it, it is very much a Hollywood movie. It's not a, it's it's by by no means an experimental movie or you know. Um, so it was really wanted to be very close to the main character. And I think we, we made sort of the decision early on that we had to shift radically depart from what, what the book does and really kind of tell it through Liesl Blatt's. Um, and that was the approach had to be that there would be sort of a bookend of, of death narrating in the beginning and in the end and having that sort of that view from, from afar that, that sees everything and that sees the world and understands war and death. And then really reducing our point of view to, to that very narrow view of a, of a child in a small town in, you know, whatever that understands nothing of politics and, and doesn't even know, you know, where her mother is or what the next town looks like. It just, it's a very, very micro, micro world. And I felt like that was, that was sort of the way that we would want it to tell that story. And that was telling a movie about Germans in, during the Holocaust, I think had to very much be that for this, personal movie we were making. That's very interesting. I The other thing that I was really curious about as I was watching it, and I, I just, I find your work so moving on The Book Thief that I had so many questions for you and I was trying to narrow it down. And one of them is, you know, there's the theme of beauty and ugliness that keeps coming up in a variety of ways throughout the film. And um, very poignantly when uh, at the end Death says, I've seen ugliness and beauty and wonder how both can be the same thing. And there's so many scenes in which you so beautifully highlighted that duality using the beauty of the landscape, the ugliness of a moment, that, that again, it was just so moving to me. And I, I just found that you, you engaged us and brought us our attention on things in, in such a masterful way. For instance, the time when um, you see this, beautiful picture of the young girl singing and then your camera just slowly moves back to show the entire Nazi youth chorus. And it's almost like your camera is insisting that we pay attention to certain moments, that right. we see that contrast. And I was wondering how did you, when you were thinking about balancing the, the there was so much beauty in the film and so much ugliness and how did you think about how to merge that? I think it really, brought us back to the child's point of view, to the idea that it had to be experiencing it through their eyes. These kids, you know, Liesl and Rudy are, you know, they're in this world and to them it's like th these, and this is the, the, what the Nazis did so well for them. They, they create these, these things, these events that were just to these kids in these little towns were amazing. Like a book burning was like a phenomenal party. It took such a long time for them to understand what was going on, the, the whole symbolism and, and the way every, um, the graphics and everything in the you know Nazi world is just so it was so mesmerizing I think especially for children for young people for people who didn't you know understand the bigger picture and it's very much about sort of not understanding the bigger picture it's seeing that and that's where the point of view is so important to us to to see it through their eyes and see oh look this is amazing we get to sing in this in this you know in this beautiful choir and we we get to these events and we have you know the uh, torches and and it's about learning slowly for them what's behind it and what it means and what ugliness is behind that, that beauty, you know, how, yeah, how it's all to, to just to control people and to slowly win them over into, uh, into your world. So um, it was very important to show those, those two sides and to show that, that, yeah, what they're, we're experiencing and what seemed f fantastic to them at the time and quickly turned out to be a nightmare. Right, the beauty and the ugliness and how they're the same. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, my other question, just from a more personal perspective, is, is whether you feel that your German origins influenced how you worked on the film, how you might have impacted others on the film. Uh, for instance, I understand that your father was exactly Liesel's age um, during the war, born the same year and in Germany, and I wondered if that or your own experiences growing up as a German influenced yeah. you or had influenced others on the set i think i think it influenced everyone obviously i think it was it was an interesting journey for everyone i think when you come and, and make a movie like this and this is basically it's sort of the opposite of pam's journey this was an american 
production of me as a German working on it, where, you know, we completely sort of crossed, um, you know, the, the opposite approach to it. Um, having an American or British, a, a British director's sort of view of this time and shooting in Germany, being confronted with Germans who are then also confronting their own past and what that means to them. And we all, you know, growing up in post-war Germany, obviously was very aware of the history and, and had, you know, it was a big part of our, you know, learning about it in school a lot. And um, so revisiting these events and going there and restaging them is obviously something that is, you know, just makes your back hair rise. And it, um, so being, but being the bridge between, in a way, be, between the German crew and the Americans, it, having been on both sides and knowing both sort of points of views, to me was very, very interesting. And it was, um, I, I think it was a process that was that was fascinating for everyone to just kind of learn with each other, to look at these events together and to learn, you know, this was also, we were shooting in the former East Germany and there were, um, we were dealing very much with the rise of, of neo-Nazis as we were doing this. There were certain towns where they told us, you know, don't, don't stage a book burning there, you know, people might might enjoy it too much you know there was so there was frightening realities that we we were just you know confronted with all of a sudden and then at the same time we were confronted with sort of like the the beauty of what happened since world war ii of the we were shooting next to the polish border and people could just walk from town to cross the river and you know it was everything was open it was wonderful and actually when we had the when we staged the, the book burning it was kind of nice to see how how ill-equipped the German extras seemed to be to, to perform these things, how, how poorly they did with all the stuff. It was very relief to see that it didn't come so naturally to them. <laughs> well, well, it was, um, obviously you do this and you do this with people you know and you, you live through these experiences even as you restage them is quite, um, is quite emotional. Yeah, wow, I imagine. Um, well, thank you both. I. I really appreciate your answers and I have taken up a lot of time and I want to make sure that others on this Zoom meeting get a chance to also ask their questions. So just want to quickly let people know, you, you know, there are a couple of ways that you can participate and ask a question. Of course, you can use the raise your hand feature, which if you look below, it says reactions. If you click on that, you'll see a little raise your hand figure. Uh, if you do that, Kenneth will call on you and uh, you'll see a pop-up to unmute your microphone at that time. And then you can go ahead and ask your question. If you prefer, you can also type a question in the chat, in the chat button below, and then Kenneth will read out that question. If you do that, please just um, mention who it is that you are asking the question of, just for clarity. Um, so uh, as we get started, as you can see, Kenneth just said hello to everyone in the chat, so you can find that if you prefer to ask your question that way. Um, but if you'd like to raise your hand and ask a question, please go ahead. Ah, someone is saying there is no raised hand feature. Kenneth, can you help them out with that? Um, can, I, can, can I just talk if it's referring to me? I did click on yes. the... I, I did click the reactions. I'm a college professor, and I usually have the raised hands on my desktop Zoom. Here, I just clicked on the link, and all I see here is a, a clap, a up, a heart, um, smiles, and other things there. There's no raised hand. Anyway, but thank you. Okay, so my question is like this. Uh, it's below all those things you just mentioned. It says raise hand underneath all those little emojis. Um, nope. But anyway, uh, we can spotlight sure. Josh Vogel, yeah. Kenneth, and he can ask his question. Okay, so with the, with the book thief, I, I assume that the idea was to follow the theme of the book. I, I did not read the book. I just watched the film. So I enjoyed the film, but the part I thought that was not as good was the morbid part of with the death and death and stuff. Did the book focus on this death person? And that's why it was part of the film? Um, yes, the book very much did that. The book was, was very much about the idea that the whole story is told from, from the perspective of death. Um, and it was, um, yeah, it was interesting that you say that you, that didn't work for you. And I, it, it's a good thing we didn't go down that path, given your reaction. Um, I, you know, I think really everyone felt like it, they wanted to to pay homage to the to the book to some extent and keep that alive. But it felt like it needed to to just be, like I said, a bookend. It needed to be a way into the story and maybe a way out of the story. But that it would be kind of off-putting to try to follow this this kind of emotional child's journey through this horrible time just with this kind of distance. So, you know, oftentimes things that work in books don't work in movies. And oftentimes, you know, I, 
even when I read a script, I don't always go back to read the book because it kind of needs to work in and of itself. It needs to be, that needs to be the document that we base our work on. Um, and sometimes just moving on from things that work well in books and just disregarding them is kind of important. Terrific. Um, do we have another question from somebody else? Hopefully that was an anomaly about the raised hand feature, but you can also ask in the chat. If no one has a question, can I ask a question about the Rosenstrasville? Of course, sure. Okay, so obviously the theme of the Rosenstrasse, I learned about, about this historical point, which I, I love history, although I'm not a history professor. I'm a college professor in business. Uh, so the I did not really know about this demonstration of, of German women to save um, their spouses. And that's fine. Everything that's part of the theme, why these people were alive in Nazi Germany. The film part of at the end where... I think I forgot her name. Was was Hannah the the, the girl the girl that was seeking her 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 mother's heritage by going to Germany? Why did the film have to end with her marrying someone out not Jewish? In other words, the whole story is fine. Obviously, that what went on during Germany. But if it's a Jewish focused film, what, again, everyone's entitled to their approach whether intermarriage is acceptable or not. But it would have been more acceptable if she would have just married someone Jewish. Where that wouldn't been, would have not been part of the story, and you still would have learned the whole story of Rosenstrasse. So why focus on the intermarriage of the second generation, quote unquote, when that did not necessarily have to be part of the film. Um, okay, I don't know if you caught that we sort of, that we had, Anna and I discussed this a little bit uh, at the beginning and- I, I, heard, I heard what you said, I heard what you said. So I, I, I'm just asking it anyway. Okay, so I would guess the first thing that I would say is that one could tell this story in any number of ways. And, and as I did say, the initial attempt was to tell the story only in the past. And there was a perception on the part of the people who were producing it and, and distributors that you needed a modern day component. And I think we chose this story because we felt again that the idea that this time was kept secret, number one, um, was something that would make Hannah the daughter, uh, it, would, it would give her a very powerful motivation to find out the past of her mother. That's number one. But number two, even more important, is that what was going on on the Rosenstrasse was entirely about mixed marriages. And that was the last privilege of protection that was taken away from Jews in Germany, and particularly in our case, in Berlin. And I felt that it would be interesting to parallel that in modern times with a mixed marriage uh, so to speak now, though the film is now 20 years old. Um, I thought it was interesting to show a situation in which somebody who had suffered when that protection was taken away under the Nazis suddenly have this trauma be reawoken and have her terror that the same thing would come back in contemporary times. So that the dangers that she saw in the Rosenstrasse as a little girl suddenly become present, if even in an irrational way, when she thinks about her daughter marrying somebody who's not Jewish, because she was traumatized by what happened to her parents. After all, her father divorced her mother, and that effectively murdered her. So suddenly, when these memories are awoken through the death of her husband, that parallel to the fate of her daughter uh, I felt was a very powerful way to tell the story. Okay. That, and that did really resonate for me as I was watching it, that you have that knowledge pretty early on that her father abandoned them so that it, it, it puts the, that whole spotlight on that whole aspect. You understand why Ruth has that reaction in the first scenes in New York when, about wanting Hannah's uh, fiance to leave and her sudden sort of fear of him, even though he had been a close family friend for so long. And once you find out what happened with her father, you go, aha, you know, so. And it is, if I may, so, you know, so much about healing also, you know, to, and I think that the journey of healing that in the modern story of the boyfriend that, that continues to be there and the healing of that relationship after the journey they go through. So I think that's very yeah. um, do, If we, do we have another question? And if not, I have one that I was saving in my back pocket just in case. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. Okay. Um, so Pam and Florian both, I mean, we talked about this and uh, I know it was controversial when it came out, but uh, 
one of the reasons why we chose both of these films to show after you know the three of us talked is because there's also another theme that runs through both films and that is of the good German, the Germans that did actually help that were not Jewish, that, that hid Jewish people, that, that helped in, in a wide variety of ways. And somehow um, that's still considered a hot topic. So I'm wondering what you think about that. Well, you, first? <laughs> well, I can go first because obviously Pam's movie is a much more political movie, I think, and, and it deals with a much more, you know, with history and it, it's actually very historical where, where um, our movie was, was based on fiction. But I think the idea, our approach, you know, was very much to make it a very personal story, to make it about just victims of the war and make it about children and what it's like to live under fascism and to live during the war and to not make it a political thing, not to make a statement about these are the good Germans, these are the bad Germans. It's just everyone is just fending for themselves in these in these horrible times and their degrees of, of being better or worse. But um, there are no true, true heroes in the movie and they're and there are obviously enough villains around as, as everyone knows, but it was, it had to be, I think and everyone was very concerned from a, also in an American movie to tell a story about, about Germans during the Holocaust and what is, what can we say and what can these stories be? What are we allowed to, what stories are we allowed to tell? So I think it needed to really be apoliticized in a way. It, it's not about politics, it's about a child's experience um, during these times, the, the temptations, the fears, the, the, the horrors. And um, I think, and that is a universal story in a way that doesn't, it's not just Germany that can be anywhere. That was our approach. I mean, your approach was, was very different and, and, and in a way, yeah, much more historical in, in a way. Uh, yeah, I would say more historical, not so much political in the sense that, again, Margaret H is always very opposed to any sort of message movie, but the, the interest, I mean, when you think about the Rosenstrasse, as I said, again, at, at the very beginning, I mean, this is about people who are, you know, whose freedoms and rights and privileges are so incrementally taken away until finally when they literally, they just had to go searching to find out where their husbands were and it became a movement but it was a spontaneous movement and it was a spontaneous movement on the part of and, and here's really what's interesting about the Rosenstrasse and how and why their protest was successful it's because Hitler feared losing the support of Aryan women he wrote about it he was terrified he considered them the civilian home front and that's why the scene at the party, which again, Margarita Style doesn't make this 100% clear, but begs all the questions. Um, when Lena goes to play the piano, she has a kind of, um, she puts a human face on the beautiful, talented Aryan women who are standing in the streets of Berlin with Nazis pointing guns at them and saying, go ahead, shoot us. That was just the sort of image that Goebbels, as the minister of propaganda, who had started this whole roundup, um, and Hitler feared deeply. So in the words of Hannah Arendt, she said, you know, there's this image of the Nazis as tough. She goes, they weren't tough. They were murderers. They were brutal. But almost every time there was significant protest, it, and there was very few times, it would succeed. And on the Rosenstrasse, they released 1,700 people from captivity. That's a remarkable number. The only four people who were sent to Auschwitz and then released came from the Rosenstrasse. So I think that's very interesting. But when we presented the film, the argument goes two ways. One way is, well, um, you know, the, the Germans were mainly horrible. They let this happen. They were complicit. Why are you making a film with a handful of good Germans? Why are you doing this? And for that, there's a very important line in the film that Margareta wrote very early on. And it said it was just one small ray of light in the darkness. It's not making a statement about how courageous all Germans were. Um, and, and there's another very famous German writer who I think put it very well when he said what a, what a movie like the Rosenstrasse shows is that it was possible to protest. You can't expect everyone to be a hero, but occasionally somebody has the strength to do something heroic. Or, as I said, they have nothing left to lose. And in those moments, they were successful. So you, it asks the question, what would have happened if more people 
had protested, we'll never know. But the fact that a few thousand Jew Jewish people survived in Berlin means there were tens of thousands of Germans who helped them. And, and that's interesting to look at, not because it makes the Germans look better under the Nazi era, it actually in many ways makes them look worse. But that's the sort of two sides of that. No, it's, it's interesting and you brought up something else that I had wanted to ask you which was, and, and I know we have a question in the chat, which I'd love for Kenneth to get to, but just that it, it was really remarkable to me and I thought so smart in the movie that there, whenever there was really some interaction with the German guards at Rosenstrasse, you could see that fear on their face. And when the guard in the window knocks Fabian down and then he sees all the women seeing him do it, he looks mortified. And I thought, you know, a, a lesser film would have just shown them as cardboard cutouts being really stern and sure of what they're doing but the humanity behind that that you know even people doing unspeakable things can be afraid of what they're doing and afraid of, of what they're being confronted with and I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, and just a quick note on that before we take this I think that I mean one of Margaret's great strengths is the fact that she doesn't ever deal in stereotypes so I think that while she has a lot of very brutal Nazis in the film who do awful things and seem to be perfectly fine doing it, um, it is always more interesting if you contrast that to somebody who's not doing that. But there was one more level of that as well, which is that the guards in front, they were policemen, they were Nazi soldiers. And there were all, again, these gradations of authority. And there were many policemen you know, who had to obey the Nazi regime, but they weren't all Nazis. So, for example, that police front who was the one who was trying to help but terrified of helping, you know, he might not have, I mean, probably as a policeman, he was a party member, but possibly not. And certainly, possibly not a supporter, but unable to do anything. Um, so there, there were all these levels of power, just straight down to the Jewish, as they called them, ordiners, who were in the Rosenstrasse. You see that they have stars. There were people in the camps and in Rosenstrasse who were Jewish who were put in charge. And then they're in an impossible situation. So it, it's, it's, very, um, it, it's a very graded hierarchy of horror, let's say. Right. Great, thank you. Um, Kenneth, would you like to read from the chat? Yes, this, um, this question is from Michael to Pamela. Where was the cemetery footage from at the beginning of the movie? My father died in December of 1960 and the old tombstones where he's buried looks eerily familiar to me. The Shiva period was similar for my family after his passing. I was 10 years old. Wow. Well, the Jew that was the Jewish cemetery in, in, in New York, in New York City. So that, that's, what, that's what those tombstones were filmed there. Is that, is that the entire question? Yes, that was the that, that was the entire question. And, I, and I'll t I'll pass on your words to Margareta that that she got the Shiva authentic enough for it <laughs> because she'll be very pleased with that, despite my interference. Just, despite right. no help from you on the stools <laughs> yeah, or, or much else. Yes. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, do we have any other questions from anybody? Or I mean, I know we're getting on here, so just want to do one last check. Okay, um, Kenneth, you don't have anything in the chat, do you? No, I do not. Okay, um, well, first of all, thank you so much, Pam and Florian. I mean, that was just so fascinating. And for those of us not in your industry to get such an inside view of how you make your decisions and how you do what you do, it's really wonderful. And I really appreciate you taking the time to do it and just being so articulate about it. Um, oh, just briefly, that, so Michael is asking, do you know the cemetery name? Was it just called the Jewish Cemetery or? Called the Jewish Cemetery? I don't, I honestly don't remember, but it is the famous and the oldest Jewish cemetery in New York City. There, I think there's only one that looks do like. Do you know what borough it was in? Queens. It's my memory that it's in Queens. Do you know what? I'll look it up, send it to Anna, and, and you can <laughs> somehow all be in communication. Yes, we, we know uh, the the person who asked so we can get that answer to him. Thank you. Um, but uh, so again, thank you so much for spending the time and for shedding so much light on it. And for the beautiful films, I just think they're remarkable and it was a pleasure to watch them again and get so much out of them yet again. Um, 
just just a few quick notes to all of you watching. If you're now more interested in the work of Margareta von Trata as well as Pamela Katz, um, in December, the Criterion Collection, which you can find out about online, actually featured some of Margareta von Trata's films. And uh, one of them, of course, being Hannah Arendt, which Pam wrote, uh, which is also a really fascinating movie. Um, and the Criterion Collection also gives you access to uh, the works of many great filmmakers. So you might want to check that out and check out Margareta von Trata, where you will also find Pamela Katz. Um, for those of you that are new to us on Stage at Kingsborough, I hope you'll check out our website on stageatkingsborough.org to find out about the other programs that we have going on this spring. We have uh, some wonderful performances filmed live on stage, uh, one from the National Dance Company of Ireland in Rhythm of the Dance. We will have the Grammy nominee, Nicole Zoraitis and Matt Baker, a uh, well-known jazz pianist doing A Rhapsody of Gershwin. And, um, we haven't announced this yet, but since you're here, uh, you'll be the first to know. We are going to present uh, filmed live on stage, the Tony nominee, Jared Spector, who many of you have seen on our stage live and in person, but you may also have seen him on Broadway as Frankie Valley and Jersey Boys, as Barry Mann in Beautiful, the Carol King musical, and as Sonny Bono in The Share Show. Um, he's quite wonderful and equally as wonderful as his wife, Kelly Barrett, who has performed many times on Broadway and also was widely acclaimed for her performance as Liza Minnelli in Fosse on FX TV. Uh, so they will be doing a concert called Funny How It Happens and it's about their marriage, how they met and a lot of great Broadway songs that they've performed over the years. So uh, those are some of the things we have going on and other things will be popping up as we announce them. So please check that out and join us again. Um, and thank you again, Pam and Florian. Really appreciate your being here. Okay. And thank you all for being here and joining us. So have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.